He leads the way for all things at Circa when it comes to MLB and NFL, but I think it's safe to say that he is uh, enjoying perhaps a busy 13 days of lead-up but maybe getting a little bit of a reprieve this morning before things really pick up. Accurate assessment? Definitely. Uh, a lot of the heavy lifting is done. We've got pretty much all of our props open for betting now, and it's going to get really busy uh, starting on Friday. Sunday is going to be crazy for a few hours, but the first few days of this week uh, it should be pretty calm. I know you're a huge baseball guy, so I'll start with a quick hypothetical or, or just over-under. I'll try and make a number here for the MLB. Uh, first pitch of opening day, over-under April 15th. Uh, it's really hard to venture a guess on this because I don't know the level of urgency of the Players Association. I would think the owners are perfectly happy to let this thing you know, drag out and make sure that they get what they want. It feels like it's going to be over that date. I, I mean, we're almost to the point where exhibition games are normally starting and they're, they're not really communicating very well with each other, which makes me think they're far apart on an actual agreement. So right now I'm pessimistic about uh, the season starting before that date. So this week, uh, like you said, it's going to get busy later in the week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm sure, at the Sportsbook is going to be absolutely out of control. Um, but I'm curious, last week, when we're talking about like Monday to Saturday, I think you guys had all the props up Friday night, Saturday morning, if I'm not mistaken. Can you sort of walk through that week and what it looked like for you and the team? Because there's a lot of people at home watching that don't know necessarily what goes on behind the scenes in the risk room when it comes to putting together as many props as you guys did. So what did that sort of whole week look like for everyone at Circa? So the most important thing is figuring out sort of what's our order of operations for the props that we're going to get up and when we're going to get them up. Fortunately, uh, I'm not required to come up with the largest prop betting menu in the world. Uh, I'm not, you know, pressured to do that. And I'm also not pressured to be the very first in the world for a lot of the props. Our number one priority is the Circus Squares, you know, the traditional Super Bowl party game where you get a square representing the last digit of each team's score at the end of each quarter of the game. Uh, but our version, you know, we attach odds to each of the squares and you aren't necessarily stuck with a bad square because you can just choose to bet on whichever square you want and you get odds that correspond to the probability of it actually landing on that combination. So that's the very first thing that I'm trying to get up. Uh, and that happens on uh, Monday after the conference championships so that they can be up on Tuesday morning. The next priority is first touchdown scorer. And the reason for that is our offering is a little bit atypical in that we list as many players as we possibly can for first touchdown scorer. This includes offensive linemen, guys that typically only play on special teams, uh, the kickers, the punters, the long snappers, the backup quarterbacks who may not even see the field in the game. Uh, the stipulation for that prop is player must be active for action. So, you know, you could bet Brandon Allen to score the first touchdown at a thousand to one. You've got action whether he plays in the game or not. You know, obviously for you to win that bet, Joe Burrow is probably going to have to get injured, which, you know, isn't a good thing to be rooting for, but for the Super Bowl, we wanted to make that prop special. And it's my favorite football prop throughout the course of the season. Uh, I like handicapping it. I feel like uh, it's just a very popular prop uh, for the public to bet. So that goes out on Wednesday. And then an even more popular market, but um, you know, I'd say the offering isn't quite as unique, is MVP. People love betting Super Bowl MVP. So we want to get that prop up next. Um, and then we've got, you know, a very long list of game props and player props and various multi-way markets. 
And I try to come up with my list on Monday after the conference championships, but things evolved during the course of the week. Uh, but everything I'm doing, you know, beyond getting up those first three really popular markets is just plugging away and working every day as long as I have the energy for it to be setting up and handicapping and just getting the pricing ready on all of the game props and player props that we're going to be offering. Uh, I got to give a shout out to Jeff Benson, our sportsbook operations manager. He makes numbers on uh, NFL props pretty much every game that we offer them for throughout the course of the season. He does a great job with that. If I'm really struggling to make a number on a particular prop, I know if he can give me a number that the average of our two numbers should be halfway decent. So uh, couldn't do it without his help. And he definitely deserves a lot of credit for our Super Bowl props. He's like the John Allerud of the sports betting industry. He plays every position <laughs> and does it well. <laughs> it just fortunately doesn't walk around with the half helmet, but maybe there's a, <laughs> a promotional opportunity in that. I, I'm going to ask something about the squares. And if I'm prying too much, just feel free to, Tell me the ease off when it comes to the pricing of the circus squares, how much is it just largely derived from the point spread in total or how much more goes into getting like some of these obscure numbers that like don't fall nearly as often? Like how big of a, a pricing sort of exercise is this for you? So it was a massive undertaking two years ago when we decided to offer this for the first time and I had to figure out how to do this. And I'm not someone that has like a ton of expertise with computers and modeling and simulations of games. So I had some help. Um, one of my coworkers got me data for the previous three NFL seasons of what the last digit was for teams at the end of each quarter of the game. And so I took that data and, you know, thinking that it was a large enough sample size to be meaningful uh, for what the odds should be. I just like took the data for the individual teams and I just did like a parlay of the two numbers. And then I also was very fortunate that that game was like a point spread of minus one. So it was almost pick them. It was very symmetrical. Really tight. Yep. That made it a lot easier for me. If the point spread was 10, uh, it would have taken me even longer, I'm sure, and probably had more mispricings uh, but between you know that data that i had for the previous few seasons and again this applied to all nfl games now the super bowl total was significantly higher for that 49ers chiefs super bowl than the average regular season game so i had to like factor that in as well and i just kind of had to use a feel for it so like obviously a higher total means a four in the first quarter is more likely than a game with a lower total, that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, we also try to build in enough of a cushion to the theoretical hole percentage that we weren't like really, you know, going crazy as far as there being things that were 200 to one that should be 40 to one. Um, right. Cause the, the whole idea was this is just going to be a fun thing for, you know, tourists and for the casual, you know, football fan who maybe only bets when it's the Super Bowl and, you know, maybe doesn't watch any games beyond like their favorite team. Yep. And you know, a lot of the markets we put up, you know, we get so much sharp action and, and that can be the, the majority of it on a lot of things. That wasn't the intention with the squares. Like we just want it to be for fun, not to have like some really sharp analytical guy like, OK, I want to bet 50,000 on this square like. I don't want to have to stress that much about this prop. Um, so as it turned out, like we certainly took uh, bets from people we consider sharp for that first iteration of the squares. And like it worked out for us that game. None of the long shot combinations came in. Those are the ones that you know had the biggest liability and continue to have the biggest liability just because people are going to want things that have a big payout. Uh, even if they haven't, you know, done a rigorous calculation of whether it has sure. value or not. So that was a, a big project for the first year. Very happy with how that turned out. 
And then things changed a little bit going into the second year because we've got a partner, Deck Prism, that does a lot of uh, simulations and pricing of both in-game and pre-game. And uh, they were able to, to help me out and kind of give me support to what I had done for that first Super Bowl of Chiefs 49ers. And then last year, it just saved me a lot of time and gave me more confidence in the pricing to have their simulations to fall back on for what uh, the probabilities were for every combination. So yeah, last year with it being Chiefs Bucks and now this year with it being Rams Bengals, we were able to get those uh, squares open for betting pretty quickly. So you're saying it's a little easier to come up with the price for the 5-2 square when you're just relying a little bit on Mr. Davidow than it is kind of coming up with that number, just pen and paper on the side? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, what they're doing is way more sophisticated than what I can do on my own, and I have a ton of confidence in the uh, strength of that pricing. So like comparatively speaking, if you were to – able to share like the squares as a prop compared to the entire prop pool is it a significant chunk of what you guys will write with this being like a unique offering that you have or is it still something that continues to grow in terms of like handle it's not going to be like a massive um proportion of the overall prop handle because a lot of these props that are priced close to even money and will be, you know, taking 10,000 as the, the standard limits, yeah. limit. Yeah. You'll just get so much handle from that. Whereas the squares, you know, each quarter of the game, that's a hundred different possibilities. So, you know, other than the first quarter for a handful of combinations, almost everything is really long odds and people are typically looking to bet small amounts. Uh, I think we made an important decision for the first year of it by allowing people to bet as little as $1 because you'll have people that come in and bet, you know, dozens of different squares. But if you can bet as little as a dollar, then it's not like a huge layout of money uh, to be able to participate in this. And it, it's a lot of fun. So we'll write thousands and thousands of tickets. But as far as like overall handle, it's it'll be a number that, I think will be something we're very happy with, but yeah, if we're comparing it to the right on the, all of the other props combined, it's not going to be like half of that or, or anywhere close. I don't think. Sure. Yeah. Just cause the limits will obviously be so different. So then when it comes to those other sets of props, um, you guys do something that I would say is unique relative to a lot of other books in terms of offering two way markets on almost everything that you post up with the option to bet the no in addition to betting the yes. Um, a lot of books, especially this year, I've noticed they'll have like alternates that go up for yardage or, or brackets, but you only be able to bet it one way. You guys are offering the no on basically everything that you post, which I think needs to get a lot more respect and talk about than in the industry than it does and be sort of the standard. But I'm curious with the no's, when you get into some of like the bigger prices for nose and you're minus 800 minus a thousand do you get a lot of action coming back the other way on the no or is it still dominated by the yes or people betting on things to happen we will definitely have sharp customers willing to lay a pretty steep no price if they think it's value on a given prop uh, i think some of these props are probably very hard to price because they're not commonly offered and how do you, you know, determine the probability of a particular defensive player scoring a touchdown at any point in the game? If the guy's only played maybe 20 games in his career, uh, I think it's very hard to price that. But, yeah, we definitely have people that are willing to, to lay those prices. I've been <laughs> slightly annoyed, actually, the last two years when we've had people lay the no price on not no safety in the game and no overtime in the game because it's like <laughs> I'm supposed to win if those things don't happen and I want to have a price where it's not value on the yes but like that's typically where the money comes in and um, that we do well when those things don't happen uh, and then some of the props are going to be like brand new that you really don't have anything to compare it to and 
we just feel our way through it. You know, if somebody sharps bet, somebody sharp bets either side of it, like we're just going to make a strong move either way so that we don't get, you know, overloaded on either side, whether it's a big uh, payout on the, the yes at long odds or some very big price on the no, because you don't want to be, you know, giving it away either. If, if it should be 50 to one and someone can lay one to 15, well, that that's not good from our perspective either. You guys have a couple of unique props that I thought stand out um, compared to some other sports books. I'm curious how you sort of went about maybe pricing them, but also what kind of action you've seen. You have a, will any teams score unanswered three times in a row, which we've seen as a popular prop elsewhere, but you've also added in the option for a fourth unanswered score in a row. And what's interesting when you look within this menu is the yes for three unanswered minus 195. You go one more time for the four times in a row, it jumps all the way up to plus 230. Um, is this something that you guys had last year? Or is it new to this year? And how have sort of you, did you go about pricing these two with such a notable difference between the two? Yeah, when I was looking at our list of props, I was wondering to myself why I hadn't used this one for the previous two Super Bowls. I know that we kind of intentionally had a smaller prop menu. Uh, starting out, we wanted to have things that were, you know, manageable that we could, you know, hang our hat on our limits and our very fair pricing. And we knew we weren't going to compete for largest menu, but I have expanded that over the last two years. So yes, this is one of those props that got added for this Super Bowl. Going back, like, gosh, probably at least ten years now. Uh, I think I was the one that suggested it back when I was working at the Hilton, now the Westgate, that we offer that prop um, because I didn't know what the price would be, but I figured it'd be in a range that would be interesting to people. And so I handicapped this prop, you know, like 10 years ago and obviously different Super Bowl than what we have uh, this year, but not all that different in terms of the pricing and the three straight scores is very common uh, for, for many games and pricing that one is like, it takes me two seconds if you give me any particular NFL matchup. Uh, so the four straight scores, like I knew pretty much right away what range that would be in. It didn't really require a lot of analysis and it's another prop that I've got support from the deck prism team with the pricing. So that one, like, I'm actually surprised you're asking about it because I think of it as pretty ordinary. So may, I'll try to throw another one at you that maybe requires a little more like subjective handicapping. Um, the both kickers or either one to have a field goal made over 55 yards. We have a potential injury to Gay with the leg issue that he's dealing with, but also a lot of hype around McPherson and how successful he's been as we go through the playoffs, but not a lot of data on him being such a young kicker. Was there a little bit more of like a subjective angle that went into this for you trying to put a price on this? rather than just looking at like success rates north of 50 for both of these guys or historically in the Super Bowl? It wasn't all that sophisticated on my part. I mean, I looked at their results for the season, um, just overall, like accuracy, what were the longest kicks that they made? Obviously, if one or both of the kickers doesn't have the leg to make a 55-yarder, like you have to factor that in. Um, but... I think they both have the leg for it. Uh, if Matt Gay is truly injured, like I don't think he's playing in the game, and that's a whole nother uh, issue. But I guess we'll see. So I just kind of you know go by feel. Like I factor in a little bit what was the actual rate that they did it. I know that's a very small sample um, for you know each kicker kicking in nineteen or twenty games or whatever it is. And like a lot of props, it's kind of, okay, you know, I made a number. Jeff Benson made a number. If you take the average, we're probably close. You know, we'll hang the prop. If somebody sharps, that's it. We make a strong move. So it's not that we're going to be perfect with the pricing. We just want to be in the neighborhood. And then it's up to us to make good decisions on how we book the market. Uh, I thought it would be interesting because I wanted to pick a yard yardage distance that was going to be hard to achieve. And of course, 
with this prop, there may not even be an attempt uh, from this distance. But I think it is, you know, something that the public wants to bet on if you can give them, you know, a long odds payout for something that has a reasonable chance of happening. So we've got a prop for longest made field goal of the game. It's, uh, I think, 46 and a half yards right now. It just doesn't generate a lot of interest because it's like minus 110 on both sides. People, a lot of people don't want to bet things that are minus 110. And so we came up with this prop to make, you know, longest field goal a little more exciting. Were there any props that you guys had maybe a larger discussion on between you and, and Jeff? Or did is it um, maybe another one where you were potentially surprised initially at how it was being bet, something you didn't expect? Uh, the one that I was like really unsure of with the pricing was, and this is a prop I didn't have in our original set, and I thought of it on Friday afternoon when I had some time. Um, will any player fumble into the opponent's end zone with the play resulting in a touchback, which I just found amusing because that's a play that like drives people crazy. And sure. a lot of people don't like that rule of it Worst being a rule touchback in if, it, if it goes through the end zone. Uh, but I wasn't really sure what the price should be. I'm like, this doesn't happen very often, I'm pretty sure. So uh, I got solicited several opinions on what uh, the – the odds should be on that. And actually, we kind of were in the same neighborhood. And so right now you can bet, yes, that that will happen at 25 to 1. And so far, we have not taken a real big bet either way on that prop. So either nobody's really analyzed it to come up with, you know, different pricing or it, it's, it's in the neighborhood. Uh, the other one that I think has been real notable since we hung it is um, will – Matt Stafford or Joe Burrow have a 15 plus yard rushing attempt. So if either one of them can have a rushing attempt where they gain at least 15 yards in the game, they could finish the game with less than 15 yards rushing uh, and it could still be a winner. It just has to be on one play. Uh, I thought it was way less likely than what the betters told me after we opened this for betting because interesting. I, I mean, yeah, again, it's a small sample if you look at games played for Stafford and Burrow, even going back um, a few years, but neither one has done it in a game this year. Burrow has only done it once in his career, like his very first game, I believe, or first, yeah, first game last year. Whatever it was, it hadn't happened long in a long time, time for Joe Burrow. Stafford is, I mean, he's not a running quarterback. He has run a little bit in the playoffs, but that's kind of an anomaly. If you look at his previous, at the regular season and previous seasons. And so I'm thinking to myself, it's going to be real tough for Stafford. Like, where is the, the urgency for him to run that many yards in a given play? He's going to need and about then, eight seconds to do it too. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's, he's not like, not the fastest guy on the field. And then Burrow, you know, better athlete, but he really hasn't been a running quarterback to this point of his career. You know, you look at his game logs with rushing. From what I've seen, he's not the type of guy that's going to want to, like, take hits to get extra yards like Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen. And then the Rams' defense is so strong that, you know, I think they're good at every level and would just make it real tough for – Burrow to get a carry of that distance, but we opened that. Yes. Like either one would get a 15 plus yard rush in the game at 12 to one. And now we're at plus four sixty five. So wow. I was way off straight uh, one way on, on the one. end. Yeah. But you know, that's, that's what'll happen sometimes when you come up with a unique prop that uh, betters will tell you that you're wrong. So that one's gotten, you know, a lot of interest early on, and I think it will continue to get a lot of interest because uh, I just think the structure of that prop is lends itself to a lot of interest from the public. I always hate prying, but before we let you go, naturally with the show, I have to ask for the people watching, do you have sort of like a, an opinion on the handicap overall for the game side or total? 
Oh, with the NFL, like I, I rarely really have an opinion. I have to pry. I have to pry. <laughs> you, I, I try not to be too opinionated uh, with NFL because I'll get myself in trouble. It's like I have to know a lot about NFL to you know be managing all the markets that I am. But I wouldn't say like I personally have an edge over you know most people that are are analyzing NFL. Um, when I was doing our pricing for Super Bowl Exacta, where you can bet, you know, team A beats team B before we know the two teams that are in the Super Bowl. My look ahead line for this matchup in making the, the price on Rams beating Bengals or Bengals beating Rams, I did make it four and a half. So it just feels like the right number to me. Like I don't see value on either side of this. Uh, with the total, I feel like I haven't had a good handle on either of these teams. Um, we opened 50, you know, Super Bowl totals typically, it feels like have been, you know, at, at least this high, if not significantly higher the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, we're not seeing a lot of interest in the over so far. Like we've gotten sharp money on the under. I definitely see the case for the Rams defense dominating the Bengals offense, uh, really, you know, wreaking havoc on the Bengals offensive line, not giving Burrow time to throw the ball. Jamar Chase not getting open because Jalen Ramsey is covering him. I can see that angle for sure. But then every time I like really believe something like that strongly, you know, we have to remind ourselves it's perfect weather conditions. Um, so any, you know, anything you're looking at from these teams earlier in the season where they had to deal with weather, you throw that out the window. I feel like they call fewer penalties in the Super Bowl than they do in the regular season and maybe the beginning of the playoffs. So like eh, maybe offensive linemen get away with holding a little bit more and that helps scoring. So, you know, <laughs> I know it's not an exciting answer, but I don't really have a strong opinion on either the side or the total. I think it illustrates exactly the type of Super Bowl that we're getting and exactly the type of matchup that we can sort of expect. So it, it was a fantastic answer. And I really appreciate you sparing an extra eight or nine minutes here. I kept you a little bit over the allotted <laughs> timeline that I estimated. But getting that insight as we, we got into the props there was super valuable. So thanks again for the time and appreciate it. And hopefully we get the MLB first pitch somewhere on the under for that projected date that I set. And the MLB season goes as expected. Cheers to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely hoping for that. And uh, thanks for having me on, Adam.